The opinions of the guests and host are their own and do not represent the opinions of Ironclad, the Border Patrol, or the Department of Homeland Security. Southwest Key's chief strategist made $800,000 in 2022 and its head of operations made $700,000. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. Its total, Southwest Key's total payroll was $465 million in 2022. So, you know, when you think about that and you think about, oh, they were granted $700 million plus maybe a little over that by the by the government. I mean, they're spending a lot of money on payroll. Um, that should raise that should raise a lot of questions there. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly. I think that's that's right. And that should raise more questions that they're spending that money on themselves other than providing any kind of value towards, you know, the unaccompanied minors. Right, exactly. Um, and, and they, you know, you can see in the 990s what they're paying for when it comes to programs that they run in the shelters. Um, a, a lot, a lot of people brought up that they, you know, found to be unbelievable was that um, endeavors at their their Pecos Children's Shelter paid a music therapist um, half a million dollars to run their, you know, music therapy program there, and their, you know, horti- you know, running horticulture therapy and, and pet therapy programs there. Um, you know, I understand the, the kids, children needing something to do there while they're waiting to for their sponsors to be vetted and while they're waiting to be placed. Um, but I'm just not sure that that it requires paying one person over half a million dollars for a music therapy program. We cut through the partisan talking points. We're not interested in perpetuating fear. We're interested in seeking truth, hearing what's really going on on America's borderland. Welcome to Borderland and Ironclad Original. On this episode, we interview a journalist by the name of Madeline Rowley, who has dug for the past six months deeper into the NGOs that are in support of the immigration crisis that's happening currently on our borders. Uh, The article that I read that she wrote was jaw-dropping, eye-opening, all the things you can think of. And I think you are gonna learn a lot from this episode. What you're doing is huge in the article that I read because the subject is confusing. And one of the areas that I haven't been able to bring on is someone who can talk about the NGOs. And so those who are listening, just a quick, a lot of the stuff that's happening on the borders, there's NGOs that are in support of the migrants who are coming across and they're funded and they're heavily funded by I don't know. I've tried to get the information. I've tried to talk to the NGOs. I get stonewalled every time. And so now we have a reporter with us today, uh, Madeline Rowley, who wrote an article that blew me away. And so thank you for joining us on the show today, ma'am. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited. So my my first, if you won't mind, you can give a quick bio to our audience so they kind of know your background. Sure. Yeah. So my name is Madeline Rowley. I, I originally actually have a background in uh, advertising and marketing, uh, but uh, my degree is in journalism. Uh, I recently, about as of two years ago, jumped back into the journalism world. Um, I wrote a couple of articles for Michael Schellenberger's public Substack, and then um, moved on. And now um, I've written several for the free press, which is where this article was published recently. Um, and uh, I have one coming out in the City Journal pretty soon. So um, I am, I'm, I'm also a Logos Fellowship with the Manhattan Institute for this year, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. And it's been such a wonderful learning experience. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I love to just look into, um, I really love to follow the money. I think those are the most, uh, those produce a, a really interesting articles. Uh, so that, that's where sort of my, my heart is at right now. Um, I live on the East coast and, um, my husband's in the military and, uh, we have one daughter. So, uh, I, I write sort of in, in the spare time that I do have. That's great. You know, I don't know if you know, but we have eight kids. Some of them are moved out of the house and go to college. <laughs> yeah. And I produce this podcast out of my house because it's just the convenience of it, you know, to be home and work. And then, you know, sometimes I have to tell my kids, like, keep it down, but, um, yeah, so I work in my own house at my own time as much as possible in this podcast. So that's great. So you said like you're inspired by the follow the money. And there's a lot of areas you can follow the money, uh, the stuff from Ukraine. Uh, I mean, you, I mean, a million different things. And I'm sure you're probably looking into that if, if you're following the money. But what pulled you into the border conversation? Um, I think actually one day I was 
it was near Christmas time. Um, my sister is an accountant and we were, my family, my dad and my, my mom was visiting and we were all just sitting around the table saying like, you know, there are so many, you know, we're, there's so many immigrants coming across the border, like who's paying for all this. Um, and I had heard about a website called usaspending.com. And this, this uh, website tracks grants uh, that go to uh, NGOs and grants contracts uh, that go to NGOs and other companies. So I started looking into um, just sort of messing around on the website. Uh, and I came across just these, I mean, my jaw was on the floor, just insane amounts of money that were going to um, specific NGOs that I didn't recognize the names of. I had no idea what they did. But as I kept clicking on their names and clicking around on the graphs and the descriptions, I started to realize that um, these NGOs had all uh, all had one thing in common, and that is that they were being funded um, to run the government's unaccompanied children's program. Um, and you mentioned that you've tried to ask where these NGOs get funding and were stonewalled. That certainly happened to me while writing this, this article. Uh, I, I, I didn't get uh, much answers from that either. But the, the great thing about this website is that it's available to the public. It's public information. And um, you can, like I said, you can follow the money. You can see exactly how much taxpayer, taxpayer dollars have been outlaid to these NGOs and how much money um, is projected to go to these NGOs by the end of these contracts. And again, like I said, the money is just staggering. Um, one of the NGOs that I looked into, the, I think the first NGO that I came across was Southwest Key Programs. Um, yeah. And they run large shelters for unaccompanied children sort of all throughout the Southwest. Uh, and they uh, one year made over, uh, were granted over $700 million by the government. Uh, and that's what sort of got me going on all this. I, I made a huge Excel sheet of, I started out looking into nine NGOs um, and narrowed it to three because nine was just really overwhelming. But uh, there are many NGOs involved specifically in the unaccompanied children's program. And I think it's important that Americans know that. Yeah, I've seen, you know, just from my own experience of being on the border and watching it, like I said, I was drove down to El Paso myself during the Title 42 change back to Title 8. And there's these organizations, these NGOs that will help bring some of the migrants to the airport, get them their tickets, you know, help them travel, give them money, uh, give them phones, like a lot of things. And everyone's like, Who, where is these coming from? I mean, there was, and this is just on my own, like investigative journalist, you know, trying to do it. I started following the vans, right? And these vans were, what they were doing is these NGOs were purchasing or renting out these, these, um, these buildings that were no longer being used, maybe because of COVID, right? They shut down. Well, now they're renting them to house these individuals as they set up the process to travel them. Correct. Yes. Yes. I, I, and I, yeah. And I actually spoke to a whistleblower, Carlos Ariana, who worked for a company called MVM Inc. Um, they've also received, I think, uh, around a billion or more uh, dollars from the government to transport unaccompanied children from the border to these shelters um, all throughout the country. And he himself uh, transported these uh, unaccompanied children. And he says the business is very lucrative. He told me that, um, you know, it's a lot of, he worked alongside a lot of really young employees, like right out of high school. Um, and there are a lot of perks to, you know, that they individually, they make good money and they also get to keep all of the um, airlines points that they accrue flying these kids all across the country. So um, he said, you know, they live like kings. They stay in really expensive hotels um, while they, you know, unite these children with specific sponsors um, or they are, you know, transporting them to a specific shelter, um, you know, whether the shelter is on the East Coast or most mostly in the Southwest. What services are they supposed to be rendering and providing to be receiving all this money? Well, they, um, you know, some of the NGOs do do different things. Um, I would say there are three main large sheltering uh, NGOs. That would be Southwest Key Programs, Endeavors, Inc. And I looked into two of those closely in my article for the Free Press. And then there's another one um, called uh, BFS. No, is that right? Um, BFS. I'm saying this wrong, but it's um, BCFS. Uh, health and human services. They're the third uh, NGO that 
um, they run larger shelters um, throughout the Southwest where they're keeping these unaccompanied children. And then there are other NGOs like um, Global Refuge, uh, which is one of the ones I looked into, and they are charged with mostly connecting unaccompanied children with either long-term foster care or foster families. Um, so, so, so these NGOs are in charge of doing different things. I would also say that NGOs like Global Refuge are also supposedly, um, allegedly, uh, they get they get millions of dollars for post-release services, which means that once a child is turned over to a sponsor, whether that's um, you know, a parent who's already in country, an uncle, an aunt, or someone who is, again, I put this in quotes, deemed um, and has been in, in, deemed, you know, eligible to um, house this unaccompanied child, then it's, uh, then um, the government or the, the, through these NGOs, the government can give money for post-release services, which is like connecting them, getting them ready for school um, and connecting them with like community services uh, where they are living. So again, the the tendrils of the, where this money go, goes runs very deep. And these NGOs, uh, you know, all do different things, which makes it even, which makes it even a little more confusing to, to track. Yeah. So I guess there's, there's a lot of thoughts I'm having right now about, about the NGOs and what they do. And so for, let me back up a little bit for those who are probably listening, who don't understand where the funding's coming from, who's paying the NGOs? Sure. So, um, so this funding is coming from the department of health and human services. And then within the department of health and human services, you have the administration for children's and family, children and families. And within there you have the, um, office of refugee and resettlement. The unaccompanied children's program is under the purview of the Office of Refugee and Resettlement, which you'll see in my article is called, I call, you know, ORR is the acronym there. Um, so ORR is within HHS. Uh, so HHS is the is the department that is providing these billions of dollars for specifically the unaccompanied children program through the Office of Refugee and Resettlement. So that's where this money is flowing through. Um, and, and again, that's what I was able to see using uh, usaspending.com. You can you know, track the money that way. It says it directly. Okay. Well, then, then the next, if I back up a little more, who gets them the funding? How do they receive that money? Yeah. So they get that money. And this is something that I, this is something that, uh, you know, I kind of ruffle my feathers a little bit. So um, this is through, they are granted this money uh, through their budget, through the Appropriations Committee. Um, and I tried many times to talk to both Republican and Democrat members of the Appropriations Committee, and no one would get back to me on this. I think it's a very fair question to ask. I'm sorry, why do you keep voting to, uh, to give HHS billions of dollars to give to these NGOs that are then who the, the executives are then paying themselves up to a million dollars in Southwest Key's case uh, to, to run these, these programs that yeah, are I read a little oversight. So. so we're so excited to launch this new piece for the Navy SEAL Foundation. We're titling it I Am. This piece plays out all the aspects that go unseen inside of the life of a team guy, the life of a family member. Everything we do for the foundation, we want it to do justice to the cause and for the community. So we want authenticity and we want it to make a difference. So we hope you get that from this. We're so excited to launch it. I've read that in that article, the Southwest Keys program, you say that one of the CEOs paid himself a million dollars. The previous CEO, if I'm correct and remember, paid himself $3 million one year. Correct. Yes. I think it was actually about um, $3.5 million. And I think his wife was listed as a VP on the 990, um, whenever it was the last year that he was the VP. He got himself in a lot of hot water. Um, for multiple different reasons. Very, yeah. Yeah. For, for, for multiple reasons, um, for misuse of federal funds, mostly. And uh, then, you know, he stepped down and now, um, now they have and Dr. Anselmo Villarreal, who makes over a million dollars a year as the CEO. So just back to to the, the former CEO, I believe his name is um, Juan Sanchez, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he did make uh, $3.5 million, and I believe his wife made over a million dollars. Um, he is the one who who started at Southwest Key Program. And, and, and while he was the CEO, actually, um, the Office of Inspector General um, 
did an investigation on Southwest Key and determined that they had misused federal funds to the tune of millions of dollars. And yet, and this, this, this investigation, I think, I believe was back in 2018, 2019. And yet Southwest Key is still making bank. Um, they have not been cut from the UAC program. They continue, they have continued to shelter unaccompanied children and they have continued to receive billions of dollars from U.S. taxpayers to run um, these shelters for unaccompanied children, despite uh, you know many of these uh, many scandals that they've had to include the misuse of federal funds and sexual assault allegations on unaccompanied children. Yeah, I read that uh, that a lot of these organizations ha- internally have issues within you know the, the sexual assault on some of the, some of these minors. In which you would think would raise questions, which you would think would cause more like an audit or something that would say, like, is this place being ran the right way or it's not? If it's not, then why keep giving them funding? Mm-hmm. And the crazy part to me is like w- what I'm keeping back to is like this is our tax money. This is our taxes that we're paying are being allotted in a way that whoever, you know, determines is handing these NGOs millions and some billions of dollars to fulfill the the this crisis that we're currently dealing with in the past four years. And, and this is more, I, I saw some of the numbers from like 2018 and then it's just jumped up dramatically, dramatically after during, during the, in the past, was it three years it was? Yeah. In the past three years, really since 2021, I mean, the numbers have just skyrocketed, obviously uh, in conjunction with, um, you know, the open borders, more people are coming through and almost in a panic. Um, you'll see, I interviewed, um, Charles Marino, uh, who, who was telling me that, you know, this was such a, the, the huge influx of, um, of immigrants at the border caused, you know, the, the Biden administration to need to make some really snap decisions. And so they have granted, they have essentially, they have given, um, ORR, they have given over the supply chain, um, um, of immigration over to these NGOs uh, who are then given being given billions of dollars. Um, and that money trickles down from these main NGOs to other smaller regional NGOs throughout the country um, who are then dispersing it um, th- through various through various different programs, um, different government programs for uh, for migrants. So um, it really is a huge chain reaction. And, and then there's something that I that you mentioned that for me, you when I was when I started looking into this, yes, the amount of taxpayer dollars being spent on this is just egregious. Uh, but I think the second thing is that you really can't look at the NGOs and and what they're spending their money on without looking into the unaccompanied children's program itself. Um, and that's when I I spoke to Tara Rodas and um, Carlos, like I mentioned, Aaron Stevenson and. I think a dozen other whistleblowers about the unaccompanied children program. Tara Rodas was, um, she still works for the federal government and she I was, would love all their names. Cause I want to talk. To oh all yeah. <laughs> oh, you should. They're wonderful. And they're just trying to, to get the word out. Um, and, and their stories are just absolutely unbelievable what they witnessed, um, in these shelters. So the ORR when in back in 2021, when, uh, there was a huge influx of people crossing the border, um, the government set up uh, emergency shelters and there was a, an emergency shelter in uh, Pomona, California. And that's where Tara Rodas was detailed to work. She volunteered to work there for, I believe it was either, I think it was like between three and six months. And, um, she, her husband is an immigrant from El Salvador. So she speaks fluent Spanish. And she said, this is perfect. I love to work with kids. This will be wonderful. And what she found was absolute chaos. Um, she ended up uncovering, uh, basically, she ended up um, realizing that these kids were going to homes that were where the sponsors were not vetted properly. Um, sponsors were falsifying documents to to get a hold of these kids. And not only that, but there were sponsors who were trying to to sponsor kids, take kids from different shelter sites throughout the country. So there were, you know, some sponsors were sponsoring 
many unaccompanied children. Um, and that's when she realized, and that's when a, a bell sort of went off in her head. And she said, I think that we are dealing with a trafficking situation here. Absolutely. So, um, and while this was happening at the same time, Aaron Stevenson is a, was, is a fascinating person to talk to because he worked for USCIS at the time. And he, again, at the same time, Tara Rodas was noticing this all across the country in California. He was getting pings and emails saying that as, as, as um, migrant, illegal immigrants were crossing the border, he was getting pings and emails saying, like, MS-13 member trying to sponsor a child, Romanian Balkan gang member trying to sponsor a child. And he started saying, you know, he ignored the first few thinking, what is this? And then as they started to come in and the pattern continued, he started asking questions. He asked the FBI what was going on. He asked contacts and other agencies, you know, yeah. what does this mean? And um, no one had much to say about it. And um, he ended up blowing the whistle. And unfortunately, he was fired for speaking out um, about what he was seeing regarding gang members trying to sponsor these unaccompanied children. This is not uncommon from what we've heard in other interviews. I've had people tell me like, yeah, these sponsors are is something that should be looked into because you have one sponsor receiving a bunch of um, underage children that is always in question, right? And that's a, that's a quite, and so you're, you're just validating exactly what other people have told us. Oh yes. And, and HHS OIG has validated this themselves. They recently, I believe it was actually in February or March. Um, I can send this to you. They uh, published a report on sponsor vetting and the entire report basically admits that um, ORR's sponsor vetting um, for the UC program is lax um, in, in so many regards. There were, I forget the, the exact percentage, but um, kids were handed over to sponsors who were still awaiting FBI fingerprinting. So Jeez. they just, you know, they just are trying to get these kids out the door without properly vetting, um, you know, these people who are, you know, allegedly taking them in. And um, I think that that is while looking into these NGOs and following the money, I, that is just the, the, the unaccompanied children program is just something that you, you cannot ignore. Um, and I believe needs to be talked about. And luckily in the last couple of days, I've had a, a couple sources, um, you know, send me some, some documents. And I think the house judiciary committee is, is finally looking into, um, gang members who are coming in through the, the unaccompanied children program. So, which is important. Yes. Yeah, we, um, we we would be if they need a platform, they're more than welcome to come here. We will definitely tell their story. Perfect. Holy smokes. You know, I, I don't know if people who are listening really can grasp the amount of money that some of these organizations are receiving. Would you mind going down kind of the list that you know in your head that however you want to pre 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 present that information of some of the money that's been distributed the main thing to know here and to look at in these graphs is, like you said, the uh, stark increase that we're seeing um, just going from 2019 up until 2022 um, with everything. I mean, it's a, it, everything runs parallel. You see the CEO compensation increases. Um, this, for example, the, the CEO of Global Re Refuge, her, um, her salary increased by 114%. So um, in 2019, she, she got paid $245,000. And uh, in 2022, we have her, we see that she's been paid uh, $525,000. So, so that's a big increase. And then if, if we go and look at, okay, well, what did Global Refuge, um, you know, how did their grant and their funding increase? Well, we see, you know, in, 20, in uh, 2018, they were granted a little over $50 million. And then by 2022, um, you know, we see that they have been granted just under uh, 250,000 or $250 million. So again, you know, that's a, that's a direct par parallel as their funding increases, their executive salaries increase. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I'll say that Southwest key programs was one of the more jaw dropping, uh, uh <laughs> ones for me. Um, made making just under eight hundred million dollars in twenty twenty two off grants, um, and then you know Endeavor Inc. I, I haven't talked about them too much here, but another interesting case where they won what's called a no bid contract to mm. open an unaccompanied children shelter in Pecos, Texas. It was a, a former um, like camp for oil workers, so they you know took it over and um, renovated that to be able to. Uh, taken unaccompanied children who crossed the border. 
um, and they won a contract for $1.3 billion, uh, which is, it's, it's a lot of money. Uh, and I think it's important to note that uh, there, uh, there was a guy who worked on the executive team of Endeavors at the time named Andrew Lorenzen Strait who formerly worked in the Biden administration and before that worked for ICE. So we have him now working at Endeavors, um, who he was just at the Biden administration, was um, helping with the transition team there. And then all of a sudden we have um, Endeavors. Well, you know, he, he moves to work at Endeavors and then they clinch this $1.3 billion contract. Um, and this is a company that has not really worked in the sheltering of migrant business before. They have helped provide staff to BCFS, Health and Human Services, which was that third other NGO that shelters unaccompanied children. So they had helped provide staffing. But in the past, they have really only run programs for veterans. And now all of a sudden, they're getting $1.3 plus billion dollars to, to be in the migrant children's sheltering space. Um, so I think that's something that you know shouldn't be ignored. Um, there's a lot of money. This is this this is a business. Um, this the open Biden's um, open border policies have created a booming business for these NGOs, and I think that's something that can't be ignored. And that's something that see the CEOs themselves have admitted. The the CEO of Global Refuge in a press conference in January said that when she started at Global Refuge, it was a team of 75 people, and by the end of 2024 their goal is to reach 700 employees. I don't know many businesses, maybe besides like crazy tech firms that grow really quickly, maybe even not then. I don't, I don't know any businesses that, that grow that quickly. Yeah. You know, th th there's, there's probably someone out here that has a counter argument. It's like, yeah, well, the massive influx of immigrants, then you're going to have to counter that by providing some kind of answers for it. And I, I personally also know that we don't have anything in place that to, to house, you know, undo, um, sorry, unaccompanied minors. We don't have anything to, to, to even house, you know, the adults. That's why they're getting these NTAs, right? That's why they're getting the nose to appears and they're getting tickets and flights out of here and go to different places. And so I imagine there's people that, that are going to argue that. Um, and, and I still, you could even use that argument and it still doesn't make sense why any CEO should be making a million dollars. Uh, I, I just find that to, to be you know, egregious, right? It just doesn't make sense. Right. And I, and I think, you know, just alongside what, what the CEOs and the executive teams are making, it's really the entire executive team. I think, um, I think, you know, there was one like below the CEOs, they're making, you know, 800 plus thousand dollars. Um, <laughs> Like I think it was the chief technology officer of one of the T uh, of one of the NGOs is making was making over eight hundred thousand um, dollars. Sorry, it's chief, uh, it's Southwest Key's chief strategist made eight hundred thousand dollars in twenty twenty two, and its head of operations made seven hundred thousand dollars. I mean that's that's a lot of money. Its total Southwest Key's total payroll was four hundred and sixty five million dollars in twenty twenty two. So, you know, when you think about that and you think about, oh, they were granted seven hundred million dollars plus, maybe a little over that by the by the government, I mean, they're spending a lot of money on payroll. Um that should raise that should raise a lot of questions there. Um Yeah. That's that's exactly. I think that's that's right. And that should raise more questions that they're spending that money on themselves other than providing any kind of value towards, you know, the unaccompanied minors. Right. Exactly. Um and and they, you know, you can see in the 990s what, what they're paying for when it comes to programs that they run in the shelters. Um a, a lot a lot of people brought up that they, you know, found to be unbelievable was that um Endeavors at their their Pecos Children's Shelter paid a music therapist um, half a million dollars to run their, you know, music therapy program there. And they're, you know, horti you know, running horticulture therapy and, and pet therapy programs there. Um, you know, I understand the, the kids, children needing something to do there while they're waiting to, for their sponsors to be vetted and while they're waiting to be placed. Um, but I'm just not sure that, that it requires paying one person over half a million dollars for a music therapy program. Yeah, that's, I like music, I get it, but that's, that seems a little crazy. Let me ask you, 
I don't know. I, I you know this wasn't in your article or anything, but mm -hmm. I'm curious. Did you dig into any of the original uh, creators of these these nonprofits? Do, do, do I don't know how that works in the sense, but is there a way to kind of see? Because obviously you hire a CEO. Okay, cool. That's who they pick. But these the, these not these non you know, you know these NGOs who started them like there's I'm curious what the connection is right yeah no that's a great question and I, and I did um, what's really interesting about these NGOs is that um, the majority of them have religious affiliations so and and then the, many of them you know change their names so for example I'll give a global refuge used to be called uh, the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. So um, they were, and still, if you go on their website, uh, they still have a little bit of religiousness in there, um, but they used to be much more affiliated with the Lutheran re religion. And they, um, I think they were started, I mean, these these NGOs, were a lot of them were started, some of them were started back in the 1800s or early 1900s um, as more um, immigrants were coming to the country. Um, so they have sort of, you know, morphed and just back in January, uh, global refuge decided to sort of, you know, kick the bucket on the, the Lutheran tithe that they had and change their name to just global refuge, um, BCFS health and human services. Uh, they are, a, were originally a Baptist organization, a Baptist nonprofit, and they have actually also changed their names now to compass connections. So they're all kind of, you know, shifting, they're shirking their religious affiliations. Um, let's see. Um, there's another one that I, um, I looked, cause again, I, I originally had looked into nine, uh, NGOs. We have church world service. They've also been around for a while and highest Inc. Highest Inc. Um, stands for the, Hebrew Inter International Aid Organization. So they are um, a Jewish um, or were a Jewish affiliated organization that um, originally helped Jews who were coming over from Europe um, to the U.S. And now they have sort of shifted. I think it's a, another important distinction here to understand that there are NGOs who mostly work within the United States, like they work, you know, domestically when it comes to immigration and the unaccompanied children program. And then there are other NGOs who work uh, mostly um, beyond the border in Mexico, Panama, et cetera. So like highest mm -hmm. does a lot of work in Central America and Mexico. They do have, you know, they do run some programs and I believe that they, that the unaccompanied children's program either did or does still use them to, um, place, uh, unaccompanied children into foster care still. Um, but they're mostly, uh, they mostly, um, run their programs in Central America and Mexico. Um, and whereas global refuge is based in, in Baltimore, uh, actually near where I live. And, um, and so they, they run their program domestically. Um, so, so that's another realization I had when looking into these NGOs is, you know, not only do they do different things when it comes to immigrants in the U S but they also, most of, some of them are working in Central America and Mexico and others work primarily here. Sorry, that sort of was a tangent, but no, no, it's, it's just, it's just crazy. Yeah. To, to answer your question, a lot of them have been around for a long time. Yeah. And they all, and a lot of them have some kind of faith-based. Correct. Origination. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Well, so when you reached out to some of these NGOs, not one of them wanted to speak. Um, I got the only NGO that I got direct answers from was via email from global refuge and their, um, you know, communications person eventually stopped responding to me. Um, otherwise I got either no response at all, or, um, people would sort of, you know, string me along and then ghost me and just, you know, not respond to my multiple requests for interviews. Um, and I, and, you know, another thing that I, that I just find to be, or found to be, you know, quite frustrating while writing this is, um, you know, I asked for comment many times from the Office of Refugee and Resettlement, and I was promised statements more than three times, um, and and I never got responses from them. Um, never got a response from ORR. They will not answer questions regarding how they're running their unaccompanied children's program or how much these NGOs are getting and why they're getting so much. And it's, it's really just like a secretive, um, program and it's very hard to get answers. Um, you, you really have to dig and, and spend a lot of time digging in the numbers, um, and digging in the confusing literature, um, on the ORR's website. Uh, it's, it's quite, uh, the unraveling of knots. Yeah, that sounds, 
this whole thing is just kind of, it, you know, you, you try and find information on this. And then now that I'm hearing it, it's like, I, I felt like there was something weird about these NGOs. And I, you know, hearing the statistics of it, when, when you wrote this, this is something that not a lot of people are talking about. Not a lot of reporters have been able to get the information. Uh, when your article came out, have you had any uh, negative feedback? Uh, that, that's probably one of the more interesting things that I have gleaned from, you know, post publish is that no, I, I really haven't received any negative feedback because I think that, um, again, I, I think that this is really a, a nonpartisan issue. I think that the numbers and where the money is going and the dollar amounts really speak for themselves. And it's very difficult to argue with um, information that's on 990s and information that you can find on what are called um, single audits. This is actually something my my sister taught me about. The, my sister, the accountant. Um, any any you know nonprofit that spends over seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of federal money in a year must be must be audited separately, usually by like KPMG or you know one of the the big auditing companies. Um, and and through these single audits, you can see where this money is passing through. Yeah, they have to be accountable for every single dollar. Correct. Yes. Uh, yes. In theory, yes, they do. Uh, and so, <laughs> yeah. again, I think that you really can't argue with with publicly available information, and you you know you can't argue with what is going on with the the unaccompanied children program, the number of um, OIG investigations that have been brought. Um, up against the unaccompanied children program. And, you know, the number of articles with the New York Times has written several articles about, um, you know, what's going on at these NGO shelters. So, um, and in regards to, to sponsor vetting or, you know, lack of sponsor vetting um, and, and, you know, sexual assaults that have happened uh, when it comes to empl employees sexually assaulting unaccompanied children um, in the shelter. So, yeah, I think that, no, I really haven't received any pushback. Well, I think I think there's too much information. There's too much facts. There's too much data to prove. Like, this is something that needs to be looked into. I, I think the, the you know one of the bigger concerns is like the, the the lack of oversight, if you will. That is like okay, the money thing is one question. That's always going to be a question. But the fear is like these are un these are unaccompanied. Minors. This was one of the biggest topics during the Trump administration. What happens with these, un, un, uh, you know, these, un, uh, uh, sorry, unaccompanied minors? It's, there's the missing amounts. There's you know thousands of missing unaccompanied minors, and I imagine a lot of it has to do with some of these programs that probably didn't document it well. You know, they obviously are not. They're they're not having you know a system that you can identify who are these people going to. Are they are they qualified people to have them? Like that that lack of oversight with unaccompanied minors is scary. That's terrifying. Us as a company, as, as a country who wants to help take in some of these these migrants who are seeking asylum or, or any of these kids are, you know, unaccompanied, like to, to have lack of oversight over our over these children is to me is like a, that's a scary thing. It, it almost feels, you know, how, that if, 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 if personally you would think to protect the miners more than anyone so that you would have more oversight. You'd have more protections in place. You'd have more things to make sure that, but this program somehow misses all that. Correct. Yeah, it, it does. And that's one of the more, most egregious things about this is just the lack of oversight uh, when it comes to this program and the chaos, uh, you know, that I learned about while uh, interviewing whistleblowers. Um, I think, you know, one of one of the more disappointing things is that um, recently the ORR has put forth uh, new rules that actually relax um, the the vetting that um, is needed to to happen when it comes to you know uniting children with sponsors um, just to make it easier to push these kids through these shelters and and through the program. Um, one of the Tara Rodas told me many times that the minute that the child is released into sponsor custody, the OR is no longer responsible and they, you know, wipe their hands and that's that they are no longer resp responsible for what happens to the child. Um, so, you know, I think that again, the lack of oversight has been noted in these, um, in these OIG reports. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, um, more lax rules, 
around sponsor vetting. There, um, in in some cases, background checks are no longer required. That's crazy. Um, and and background checks on any other adults who live inside the home are no longer required. Um, luckily, actually, I was I was sent recently. Um, uh, Senator Manchin, um, along with I think it's like 38 other Republican senators, um, have initiated what's called a Congressional Review Act, which means that um, they it's a possibility that this rule can be overturned. Although I've been told that it's quite rare for that to happen. Um, I talked to a Congressional Review Act expert recently who said that it's more of just like a political, you know, you know, peacocking. Posturing. Like, yeah. Posturing. Yeah, exactly. Um, saying that, like, you know, we don't agree with this. We need to overturn this rule um, when it comes to to the relaxed rules surrounding unaccompanied children uh, that were put forth. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. I don't have too much too much hope there, unfortunately. Um but there's no question that this program needs an overhaul. Absolutely. You know, I, I think, you know, we've, we've gone through all the stuff in, from your article and the information that you presented. I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll link your article as well for those who are listening to this so they can find it. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to use this platform to share? You're more than welcome to right now. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I think the, the, the main thing is that this is just all publicly available information that was even sh- was shocking to even me um, to 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 discover and and to learn. And um, I think that it, our all the information we need about what our government is doing and trying to do is like right at our fingertips. Um, it's just a matter of like diving deep and um, and following that money trail and seeing where our tax dollars are going uh, and and what it's being spent on. So. Um, yeah, I just think that, uh, you know, I hope to continue to look into these programs um, and continue to see uh, follow up on, uh, you know, trafficking allegations. That That's where I'm hopefully yeah. going to be look, what I'm hopefully going to be looking into next. So uh, that's, more that's to come exactly. For me. <laughs> yeah, that's where my mind goes to. Like, this has to be deeper. This, this OK, it's without wearing like a, you know, the, the tin hat thing, you know, to try and be really legit on this, there's a big chance that some people are taking advantage of this loose system to use it to traffic minors. That's where I go. That's, that's exactly what it looks like. You know, not saying the whole system is built for that, but this creates a lot of vulnerabilities for any kind of trafficking organization to gain uh, a means of, of these, you know, unaccompanied minors. And for it, for the unaccompanied minor program to be this laxed is intimidating, scary. And yeah, absolutely. This needs a bigger platform. For sure. And I think the last thing I'll say in, in regards to that point is that we, we can't uh, just, we can't ignore that the car- cartel is heavily involved in this as well. Um, in, uh, you know, tra- trafficking kids and trafficking migrants in general across the border. So I think that, um, you know, all of this is connected in in so many ways, um, and you know we are, as taxpayers, are paying for this to happen, and that's a you know a reality that hit me really hard. And um, and yeah, I think that this is all connected. It's it's circular, um, and I think that um, there's much more work to be done on this. So. Well, we're excited to help you if needed. Uh, any of your whistleblowers need a platform, they have it. They can reach out to me directly. They can reach out to Bruna. It doesn't matter. Uh, and as well as next time you come with another article and you want the platform, it's yours. Thank you so much Thanks for your so time, much. man. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Vincent. Absolutely. Thank you for watching Borderland and Ironclad Original. Please go ahead and like, subscribe, tell your friends. Or if you guys want to, go check us out on YouTube follow us there. Thank you for watching the show.